Good afternoon. My name is Michael Weston, and I welcome you to the National Hurricane Conference General Session Number Two, Hurricane Dorian in 2020, Surviving the Impossible and Responding to the Unimaginable. Uh, I am joined uh, this afternoon by our co-chair of the Access and Functional Needs Subcommittee, Elizabeth Davis, and she will be facilitating your questions later on in the program. Um, we uh, wanted to convey our appreciation to our committee to get us to this point. It's not the point we expected to be at, but here we are. Uh, it's now uh, my pleasure and opportunity to welcome Melanie Wubbs, Medical Response Coordinator, Technical Specialist for the International Health Unit of Samaritan's Purse. I wanna take a couple of minutes just to tell you a little bit more uh, about her. Uh, Melanie's uh, career in healthcare started as a critical care registered nurse in the emergency department and remote health posts in Northern Canada. She has a bachelor's of science in nursing with a post-grad certificate in advanced practice emergency nursing. After pursuing studies in geographic and tropical medicine, she joined Samaritan's Purse International Relief in 2017. She is a technical health specialist for the International Health Unit, specializing in rapid assessment, program planning, clinical program management. Uh, she's been involved in past projects that have literally taken her around the world uh, to, from Mosul uh, to Regina uh, and into Colombia. Specific to today, she'll be, uh, when we envisioned this session, it was for her to share uh, her uh, management of uh, healthcare unmet needs uh, in the Freeport Bahamas in the aftermath of Hurricane Dorian. Uh, since that time, she has run Samaritan's Purse uh, Medical Ops uh, in Central Park. So her presentation is incredible. The uh, timely for all of us, and uh, I see that a tropical storm has now been named in the Gulf of Mexico a short time ago. So. Uh, I have no doubt I have everybody's undivided attention, and I will now turn the program over to Melanie. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so, so much, Michael. Um, yeah, it's my honor to be able to pre to present to you all today. Like Michael said, uh, when we first envisioned this session, it was to be a joint session with um, members of the team from the Bahamas, from the Grand Bahama Health Service and from the Ministry of Health there to talk about the experience. Um, but today it will just be myself um, and I'm excited to share with you regarding Samaritan's Purse's response to Hurricane Dorian. So this uh, afternoon, I'm just going to start with giving a brief overview of uh, Samaritan's Purse International effort. Um, and then the primary focus of our time will be on our response to Hurricane Dorian. Uh, we're going to focus in on the medical response uh, to the flooding of Rand Memorial Hospital in Freeport, Grand Bahama. Uh, and then I will also speak briefly regarding the other multi-sectoral relief efforts that Samaritan's Purse started back in September of 2019 and is ongoing to today. Uh, we'll speak a little bit about the transition and the integration with the Ministry of Health for the hospital program. And following that, just going to touch very briefly on something that's very real in our world today, uh, COVID-19, and how taking that into consideration uh, for responses, adaptation of ongoing programs, and considerations that need to be taken into account as we seek to respond to not only hurricanes, but other natural disasters. So, Samaritan's Purse is a non-denominational non-denominational evangelical Christian organization, which provides spiritual and physical aid to hurting people all around the world. Since 1970, Samaritan's Purse has helped meet the needs of victims of war, poverty, natural disasters, disease, and famine. We have head offices in 
the US, in Canada, the United Kingdom, Germany, and Australia, as well as country offices in um, anywhere from 19 to 20 countries around the world. A lot of these offices were set up um, in places that have protracted long-term humanitarian emergencies to provide long-term programs. A lot of these offices, including our one in the Bahamas, were started in response to a natural disaster or a crisis um, and have stayed to provide ongoing programming for the communities there. Some examples of that include the Philippines um, after Typhoon Haiyan uh, when we responded there, and now there's an office there that's set up that helps to provide long-term water projects, shelter, um, as well as programs for the community in areas where natural disasters like typhoons and hurricanes are a seasonal occurrence, um, providing them with the tools to prepare, um, as well as um, other aspects of programming to help build resilience um, and offer psychological aid. Our international, so now I'm just going to talk a little bit about an international disaster response deployment overview. So at headquarters, we have an international disaster unit that seeks and exists to respond to disasters. So they do that by tracking storms, keeping a close eye on briefings regarding displaced people or conflict, as well as utilizing our network across the globe with our country offices um, to hear about smaller scale emergencies such as landslides or flooding that might not make international news but still require a, a response. If a disaster is to be responded to, then an incident management team is established to manage that response. So they identify the scope of the equipment, the supplies that are needed, the staff, and as much as possible, um, a bit of a response plan. All of that, as I'm sure many of you know, working in disaster relief can change very suddenly once you get on the ground and actually find out what the situation is, um, the other resources that are available, available and so forth, um, but this team really forms the backbone of the response in the support of the people who are on the ground. So the people who are on the ground are our disaster assistance response team, um, and this is made up of disaster specialists. These are professionals in their field who have a wide range of experience working in humanitarian work, disasters and conflict. So some of the professions that we deploy as disaster specialists include WASH um, specialists. So these are people uh, who have a background in water, sanitation and hygiene. So they establish emergency water systems um, as well as um, manage waste and things like that following a disaster. Uh, we have shelter technicians who are looking for both that short-term and long-term solutions um, where housing and things like that have been impacted by hurricanes or floods or tornadoes. Food specialists who work um, providing emergency food as well as things like harvest rest restoration um, and other programs um, designed when the natural disaster, the hurricane, the cyclone, or things like that impact the harvest, um, and recognizing that very early intervention um, can help save lives. We have distribution teams who work to ensure that the needed supplies get handed out in a safe, controlled manner to the most vulnerable. We have medical and health professionals who deploy um, in a variety of ways, and we'll talk a little bit more about how that happened here in the Bahamas, um, as well as very, very importantly, and sometimes maybe not, you don't get that nice shot with a helicopter with these people, but logistics and administration. Um, we, there's a vast amount of coordination that needs to happen to um, move goods, move people and money to where the needs are the greatest. So recent responses of our international disaster assistance response teams include Northeast Syria and Iraq, 
uh, where there's a multitude of displaced persons, uh, providing clean water, food, and an emergency hospital for victims of the cyclone in Mozambique last spring, as well as running Ebola case management and infection prevention control programs in the Democratic Republic of Congo during the last Ebola outbreak. Um, and as we'll touch on a little bit more today, uh, extensive hurricane response and recovery programs following um, Maria, Irma, and of course, Hurricane Dorian. Samaritan's Purse is also involved in domestic disaster relief. So since 1998, uh, staff and volunteers have worked and assisted over 50,000 households in the U.S. affected by natural disasters. Our teams respond following hurricanes, tornadoes, wildfires, ice storms by quickly providing emergency supplies, cleaning, and helping to repair and rebuild homes in um, communities across the United States. In 2019, Samaritan's Purse responded to 16 different disasters across 10 states. This included tornadoes in Alabama, Missouri, and Ohio, uh, a tropical storm that hit Texas, as well as flooding um, across the Midwest. These domestic programs also run in Australia and, and in Canada, uh, where the primary natural disaster that they assist with there is wildfires, floods, um, and occasionally tornadoes in the eastern parts of, um, of um, Canada. So now we're going to transition, now that you kind of have a little bit of a background of Samaritan's Purse and their international relief program, we're going to focus on the response to Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas, and more specifically the medical response that was coordinated with the Pan American Health Organization and Grand Bahamas Health Services. So pictured here, uh, you can see our emergency field hospital, uh, which I'll be referring to throughout the program, um, sometimes with the shortened abbreviation of the EFH, so the Emergency Field Hospital. So Hurricane Dorian, just for a little bit of background, um, taking into consideration this is a hurricane conference, uh, whom I am sure many of you are um, familiar with Hurricane Dorian. Um, it was the fourth named storm and the second hurricane of the 2019 hurricane season. Dorian formed on August 24th in the Central Atlantic and gradually strengthened, becoming a hurricane on August 28th. It uh, rapidly intensified and on August 31st, Dorian became a category four hurricane. On September 1st, Dorian reached category five with a maximum sustained winds of 185 miles per hour and making landfall, as you can see on the right of your screen, on Elbow Cay and Abaco Island. It then continued westward and made another landfall on Grand Bahama Island. The ridge of high pressure steered Dorian um, ongoingly westward um, and then on September 2, it stalled as that, um, as that ridge of high pressure collapsed, um, and it stalled just north of Grand Bahama Island um, throughout the day on September 3rd. At its strongest, Dorian was a hurricane, was a category five hurricane, um, and this was the strongest hurricane that had ever made landfall in the Bahamas um, with, as I, with, as I previously mentioned, wind speeds reaching 185 miles per hour and a storm surge of up to 23 feet um, overtook Grand Bahama, Grand Bahama Island. Pictured here is some of the devastation on Abaco Island. So Abaco and um, the Keys all along the eastern side of it bore the brunt of the wind of the storm houses, boats, 
trees, everything lifted up, tossed around like matchsticks. Um, debris was everywhere. People's homes were destroyed. The roads were covered. Um, and all of the power and the water systems were just simply decimated by the storm. Things looked a little bit different on Grand Bahama Island. As the storm stalled over Grand Bahama, moving at a painstakingly slow pace of only one mile per hour, the combined rainfall of about 89 centimeters of rain fell. That combined with the storm surge, uh, which reached in some places up to 23 feet high, caused incredible amounts of flooding throughout the island. On average, about five feet worth of water covered more than 50% of the island. As the storm stalled and the rain continued to fall, the water, rather than just coming up with the storm surge and then receding, uh, the water pooled um, and sat in many areas, covering more than 50% of the island. Um, this damaged homes, the water system, the airport, and um, most important to this presentation and story, uh, Rand Memorial Hospital. All right, we're just going to go to a video here. So this video is just going to show um, just a bit of an overview of the response and the needs in, bah in the Bahamas following the landfall of Hurricane Dorian. Um, and then we'll kind of get more into the specifics of the response. Michael, I'm not sure. Dorian was one of the worst storms we've seen, actually the worst we've seen in this part of the world ever. And the people of the Bahamas were strong people. We have faced hurricanes for decades, but Dorian is one of the first ones that are taking lives, taking property, and is just affecting us to that degree. A lot of people have lost their homes. They were flooded out with sea surges up to 20 feet, 23 feet, and that caused massive damages. Unfortunately, the hospital, the Rand Memorial Hospital, was also ruined by Dorian, which led us to asking for international help, such as Samaritan's Purse. Samaritan's Purse, we were here within just a few hours. Uh, we've, God has blessed us with uh, great equipment, great team, and uh, one of the first things that was needed was tarps. Dorian was one of the worst storms we've seen, actually the worst we've seen in this part of the world ever. And the people of the Bahamas were strong people. We have faced hurricanes for decades, but Dorian is one of the first ones that are taking lives, taking property, and is just affecting us to that degree. A lot of people have lost their homes. They were flooded out with sea surges up to 20 feet, 23 feet and that caused massive damages. Unfortunately, the hospital, the Rand Memorial Hospital, was also ruined by Dorian, which led us to asking for international help, such as Samaritan's Purse. Samaritan's Purse, we were here within just a few hours. Uh, we've, God has blessed us with uh, great equipment, great team, and uh, one of the first things that was needed was tarps, water purification systems, and then where I am right now, uh, emergency field hospital. This is the same hospitals that the U.S. military uses, but we have exactly the same equipment that they have as state-of-the-art, and we're here in Freeport right now taking care 
of all the hospital needs of uh, this community. So uh, right off the bat, we, we saw everything. It was mostly predominantly uh, storm water related. The floodwaters have uh, left a lot of people with uh, injured uh, lower limbs. So that's a common one. So a lot of uh, potential for tetanus to set in and it created a lot of distress. So where people are having a lot of emotional distress, uh, not just the uh, physical distress of being off their medications having been swept away by the floodwaters. Now, that's a, maybe the most common story right there. The patients that we've served seem very grateful and thank us over and over again uh, that we're here. And so I think that makes our work really meaningful that they see our care in that for them. The love of God is so evident in you guys. The kindness, the, the love shown and the appreciation. And so we are grateful to God for Samaritan's First Hospital here. You can tell that they, they want to help and, that, and that's what energized Samaritan's First, helping and being there for the patient. We're here on the island of Abaco in Cooperstown doing an NFI distribution today. Uh, we're providing blankets, kitchen kits, solar lights, jerry cans to transport water, all of these just basic items that people need uh, even now as they start to recover. So we've been able to provide generators to households that most needed it. We've also distributed a lot of tarps so that people could get that over their roofs and start to protect uh, what's left of their homes. And so if you fly over the area, you'll see blue tarps going up over the home. Uh, all over the place. With our reverse osmosis filtration system, we're able to pull water directly from the ocean uh, and provide clean drinking water on the other side for the community. This is a big help. And as long as we remember Dorian, we will remember Samaritan first. We were over to the church um, for five days. When I came home, my kitchen, everything was down on the ground. Prayer changes things, and I believe in prayer. They have coming from the Lord. The Lord just allowed me to walk out there to meet you this morning. Because it's so appreciative to me to see God send the two gentlemen out here for me to meet them. They give me a, a generator. It helped me a lot. It helped me a lot. And I am so happy. I'm very happy. I'm very thankful for what you all are doing. Well, man, God is a good God. Anytime you trust God, you'll see. When you see destruction like this, it always, um, I mean, just, you know, what do you say? Uh, when people have lost everything, they have no way to recover. God has called us as Samaritan's Purse to respond when there's storms, uh, when there's a crisis anywhere in the world. And of course, Bahamas, these are our neighbors. We want to help people, not only physically, but spiritually, because we want Christ to be seen, and we want to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Great, thank you so much, Michael, just for the help with the tech support there. Um, so I'll go forward and explain a little bit more about the Bahamas response. These are the key components that we look at as we plan and deploy any response, and especially medical responses. We look at speed, staff, space, systems. And we're gonna to touch on all of these as I go through the timeline of the response, telling the story of how we went from a field that you can see on the left side of your screen um, in a hurricane to less than a week later, the hospital that you see on the right side of your screen. So quality is speed. On Monday, September 1st, as Dorian was pounding the Bahamas, Samaritan's Purse DC-8 plane was being loaded with rapid response items, tarps, water purification systems, generators, 
blankets, anything that might be needed in those first crucial hours after a hurricane. Disaster specialists were being flown into Greensboro, North Carolina from all around the world, from the UK, Canada, all over the states. So that way, the moment the plane was cleared to take off and land in Nassau, our team would be ready. On Wednesday, September 3rd, the plane was cleared uh, to land in Nassau, and we took off from Greensboro, North Carolina at about 10 in the morning um, and landed in Nassau around noon. Uh, from my experience, this was one of the closest to home deployments that I, I had done, um, and that the speed in which we were able to respond um, was just so crucial, um, but also made a little bit easier by the fact that the Bahamas uh, is, so, is so close to home. The moment we landed, the supplies were offloaded from the DC-8 and the logistics specialists got to work. Uh, their job was to move the supplies as quickly as possible from Nassau to the hard hit areas of Abaco, the, um, the um, surrounding keys, as well as to Freeport. So a barge was loaded and set off for Marsh Harbor. And as we were able to, um, to access other um, aviation methods to get generators and things like that where they needed to go, those were loaded and uh, sent off as well. While we were there, um, in that very first day, there was also arrangements being made by the incident management team to move other aviation assets from Samaritan's Purse down to the Bahamas to allow for easier movement of goods and also people. So our helicopter came up um, from where it was as well as a smaller caravan plane used to primarily move people. On that same day, uh, Wednesday, September 4th, after all of the rain had kind of stopped and this uh, surge and floodwaters had started to recede on Grand Bahama Island, Rand Memorial Hospital became a huge priority for not only the Bahamian government, uh, but also the Pan American Health Organization, which is the Western Hemisphere um, branch of the WHO. It was evident that the four feet of water that had entered into the hospital and stayed for more than 24 hours had done immense amount of damage and they were going to need assistance. At that moment, only the emergency room um, wing of the hospital was inhabitable. All of the in inpatient rooms, the maternity, the OR, um, all of that had been underwater um, and was unable to serve the community. As medical care falls very strictly under the authority of national governments, um, all medical intervention needs to be very closely coordinated with them as well as organizations that, with uh, the assistance of the Pan American Health Organization. Um, as much as people are grateful if you show up with a tarp and help them with their roof, um, the same does not go for medical care. You cannot just simply show up with a stethoscope around your neck and begin to see patients. Um, there's a lot that needs to happen before that. Um, so the first step of that is an invitation to respond. And that afternoon, uh, Samaritan's Purse received an in invitation from the Ministry of Health of the Bahamas and uh, the Pan American the Pan American Health Organization, or PAHO, as it's known for us to send a tier two emergency field hospital to assist in Grand Bahama. Samaritan's Purse accepted that in invitation and the DC-8, which landed in Grand Bahama on Wednesday afternoon, turned around and went directly back to Greensboro and Wednesday night, it began to be loaded with the field hospital. At that point, none of us had been on Grand Bahama Island. I, myself and one other colleague were on the DC-8 that landed in Nassau that Wednesday, but the airport was closed in Grand Bahama. We had no location set i had had one phone call with the administrator of Rand Memorial Hospital, but we knew that we had to act. We couldn't wait. 
uh, we had to send the plane back, we had to start to pack, we had to get things to NASA, so at least it would be closer, um, and the moment that we could have access, we would be able to move. And this quote, uh, which I love and just want to share with you, is from a doctor in the Israeli army, in the, is, in the Israeli army who's a disaster specialist. He says, we are not running into the fire, but we're also not waiting for the fire to die down. You have to understand that you must start to move before you have a clear understanding. Some say, don't leave if you don't know where you are going to land. No, we are leaving, and if we need to go elsewhere, we will. But if you wait, you will lose another 24 hours and lives. Um, and that was really at play here in the Bahamas as well. In 24 hours, maybe we would know a little bit more. We would know maybe where we would know if our plane could land in Freeport. But at that stage, you then lose that 24 hours um, and the potential for lives to be lost. So on Thursday, September 5th in the morning, um, I had coordination meetings in Nassau with the Ministry of Health and the Pan American Health organization to gain further context as to what the situation was and how they saw us being able to respond and help. But as many of you guys know, meetings in, in the capital don't always reflect what's on the ground. So it was very important that uh, myself and my other colleague were able to get to Grand Bahama. That afternoon, um, we were at the airport, we waited and waited and waited. Um, the airport, both the main airport and the private airstrip in Nassau was jammed packed. Search and rescue helicopters, private planes, private helicopters, getting people from Abaco, from Grand Bahama to Nassau for medical care, um, to be reunited with family members. Um, and it was very difficult to find um, transport out to the island. Uh, but finally, at about two in the afternoon, we got word that we had a seat on a plane, boarded the plane, waited probably another hour and a half on the tarmac, waiting for clearance to take off. But then Thursday afternoon, around 3, 3.30 in the afternoon, we were able to land in Freeport. The airport there, the runway, barely dry from the storm surge that had covered it, debris cleared as best as possible. Um, but we were on the ground. So our window of daylight was small and we had about two hours to accomplish a lot of tasks. Uh, we had to assess the hospital to see all that was damaged and meet with the RAND team to discuss how we can integrate in with them to best support and provide medical care for that community. We also had to assess the airport was the runway, while it could land the small plane that transported us and the team from Pajo, would it be able to accommodate the larger DC-8 to carry the hospital, or would we have to split things up into smaller loads? If the airport wasn't an option at all, would we have to then look at barging or, or other means of transportation for the field hospital? Um, and as I learned that day, an airport is one thing, but does the equipment exist there to offload uh, the supplies from the airplane? Was there a K loader? Had that been destroyed by the storm as well? So all of these questions were very important, um, but also the site selection. So as one of the pillars of response as well as speed is space we needed to find a location for the field hospital. Um, very important when you're looking at location for hospitals is the location. It needs to be um, accessible for people. It needs to be located where the majority of the people live, um, ideally close to the health facility that's being supported, um, but also where the road condition can support an ambulance. Um, Pre-disaster, you might think, oh, this spot would be perfect, but until you actually go and lay eyes on the site, you don't know what the previous three days of wind, water, flooding has done to what prior might have been a perfect site. Um, it needs to be fairly flat, and in the case of Freeport, not currently flooded, 
and there needs to be the ability to set up uh, water sanitation and hygiene for the hospital um, for the hospital facility. Um, pictured here is um, a snapshot from Google Maps. So prior to landing on Freeport, uh, we were able to look at Google Maps and look for potential sites. So that way we had a bit of an indication of where to start looking once we arrived on Grand Bahama. So once we were there, we were able to determine that this field located directly across the road from Rand Memorial Hospital would be large enough and flat enough and able to secure for the hospital site. Um, and that's shown there indicated by the red star on your screen. You can see that we're looking for an area that's between one and a half to two acres, which in an urban setting uh, can be a little bit difficult to find. So looking at another component of the disaster framework uh, is the staff or the supplies. So all of the components of an emergency field hospital are pre-kitted and they're stored in the warehouse ready to be shipped anywhere in the world at a moment's notice. But like I mentioned when I was talking about the airport, sometimes getting it to the end of the road where it needs to be can be the issue. Uh, but thankfully on that Thursday when we were in Freeport, we were able to determine that the runway would be able to sustain the DC-8 and that there was a piece of equipment there that could help us to unload. Now, all of this was really important, but had not delayed the takeoff of the DC-8 from Greensboro. The first load with the first 30 staff and the first load of equipment that Thursday night landed in Nassau. So on Friday, September 6th, uh, we um, began to move all of our staff from Nassau to Grand Bahama um, by the small caravan plane and site prep began. Gravel began to get shoveled. Um, the site was laid out with the, with, with the architects in line with the field hospital design that even though we have designs need to be tailored for every space. Um, the second load of the DC-8 flew from Greensboro that afternoon landing directly in Freeport so we were able to unload that and begin work on the hospital. So in the background of course, the people of Grand Bahama were still receiving uh, care at, Grand, at Rand Memorial Hospital in their emergency room, and all critical patients at that point were being uh, sent off island through a variety of civilian and military um, transports. So once the plane landed that afternoon, uh, we started to set up and worked throughout the night to begin to set up the tents. Saturday, uh, September 7th, um, that morning ongoing, continuing to set up as well as being able to work with logistics and start procurement for very critical items such as diesel for the generators. So as you can see here, uh, we spread gravel to form the base for the tents and then tarp, and then the tents just go on top of that. We can set up on a variety of surfaces, concrete, grass, gravel. Um, while the physical construction was going on, so was coordination. Uh, we needed to find out as much as we could about the current healthcare system on Grand Bahama Island. What was destroyed? what was functioning and what was the best way forward to be able to assist them. How could the best care for all of the residents on the island be maintained even though they had suffered a devastating blow to their primary hospital? We, went, we met with the administrators, the doctors, the surgeons, the nurses, lab, x-ray, social work, so we could all begin to work together um, to provide a good continuum of care and transfer 
um, for their patients that they have been caring for under very um, difficult circumstances for the previous days. On Saturday night, the uh, DC-8 came once again with the original load that had been flown to Nassau. So this completed all of the um, modules and the kits that we would need for building the hospital. So on Sunday, uh, the setup focus turned towards systems. So this also is one of the pillars of the response. So looking at systems from a construction and operational standpoint, but also from a clinical standpoint. From a utility perspective, the emergency field hospital is completely self-sufficient. Uh, post a disaster, whether that's a hurricane or a cyclone, there can be no expectation of any kind of functional systems in the location that you deploy to. So from an electrical standpoint, we bring our own generators and then the hospital is wired completely independent of any existing grid. The primary generator runs 24 seven and then with a secondary backup generator uh, that is ready to go on a moment's notice. Once we're operational, uh, we need a assured supply of constant power for uh, places such as the OR, the ICU, uh, fridges that hold critical medications and lab supplies. So the electrical um, is of uh, great importance to the hospital setup. In addition, uh, water. So every place that we go to requires unique solutions to the water challenges that are presented. In Grand Bahama, the combination of the storm surge and the rain, which flooded the water table, um, had contaminated the city's water supply. Uh, so for our initial startup, uh, we were able to access non-potable water. Uh, we would truck it and store it in a bladder and then run it through our uh, reverse osmosis desalination unit to cleanse it. And then it would be pumped up to the storage tank that you can see there, which was placed on a shipping container. So from that tank up there, which held the clean water, the entire hospital, all of the tap stands, the washing sinks, everything was fed through a gravity system that came down from that tank. Once we were on the island for a little bit longer, we were actually able to drill a well on the hospital property. Uh, once again, run it through the desalination reverse osmosis, um, but it cut out needing to truck the water. In addition to setting up the utility systems, setting up the clinical systems also needs to happen. As much as we can have a framework for what that looks like within the hospital, obviously, so we can prepare and send the appropriate medicine, supplies, and staff, everything is very unique to a uh, um, response. We need to answer questions about how are we integrating with local staff? How will the patients come to us? Is there an EMS system? All right, now we need to coordinate with them. How are we notified that they're bringing us patients? How do we know how to call them if we would like to refer someone? How do we keep records? So that way, once we leave, these patients can continue on with their regular healthcare, um, but those providers can have access. All of this needs to be at least established on a basic level prior to opening so that way we can provide comprehensive, high quality care. A lot of these systems after day one might have modifications and changes, but they need to at least be on the radar of all involved so that way we can uh, provide quality care. After each tent is set up, um, the insides of the tent need to be set up to uh, function as a hospital. So this includes the ER, the wards, the pharmacy, the lab. It needs to be put together. The beds need to be made, the shelves constructed, and all of the hospital supplies put in place. Uh, the OR needs to be sterilized and cleaned, so everything is ready. Uh, for the moment that first patient comes in. Because you never know, it could be someone who has a cut finger um, and it's very basic, or it could be an, emer an emergency. And once you're the designated healthcare provider for an area, you need to be able to provide all levels of care that you've committed to. 
So the setup and the final preparations continued on Sunday and Monday, and then on Tuesday, less than a week after Dorian hit Grand Bahama, we opened the doors of our Tier 2 emergency field hospital. The Rand Memorial ER closed, and all ER patients, inpatients, and surgical patients now flowed through the emergency field hospital for their treatment. Uh, this photo was taken uh, a week or two after we opened, but on it you can kind of appreciate the layout of the hospital. On the left side of your screen, you'll see the staff areas of the office where all of our clinical and operational staff slept, um, dining, washrooms, showers, and then on the opposite side of that kind of fence, you see the clinical portion. So the waiting room and the emergency room where uh, we would receive patients, the lab and the pharmacy, the ICU and the step-down ICU, the operating theater, and then to the sides, the wards where the inpatient stayed, as well as the supply areas for the hospital. So this was a emergency field hospital tier two. So the WHO um, mandates the types of emergency medical responses and they are designated um, based on the capacity. So uh, this was a tier two, which meant that it had a emergency department. So this busy area saw about 120 patients per day, uh, people from all over Grand Bahama Island, people who had uh, sought refuge there from, Ab from Abaco, as well as we were the referral points for all of the clinics um, and other healthcare facilities on the island. We coordinated with EMS and received all of the ambulances from across Grand Bahama. In the first few days after the storm, we saw a lot of injuries from the storm. So a lot of them were either broken bones from falling and a lot of wounds and cuts from people who are walking through water with debris swirling around them. We also had a lot of elderly people um, whose medications maybe had floated away or they didn't have access to them. Uh, when you're dealing with chronic conditions such as high blood pressure or diabetes, not having access to your medication for several days on end can put you into a bit of a crisis state. And uh, we definitely cared for them in our hospital as well as injuries. We had an operating theater which could do um, emergency as well as urgently needed uh, cases. We had a general surgeon as well as an orthopedic surgeon. So while we could not do all levels of surgery, uh, the um, fact that we could do the emergency cases as well as the urgent ones uh, was critical for uh, trauma, people involved in car crashes, falling off roofs, other injuries like that, uh, especially post-hurricane, as well as decreased the amount of referrals that needed to be sent off island uh, to the overburdened hospitals in Nassau, where everybody had gone initially, as well as all of the injured from Abaco. We had uh, inpatient care for up to 36 patients. So this allowed us to care for people who needed admission, often those who were elderly um, or had had surgery, and allowed us the capacity to care for them for sometimes days while their families worked to ensure that their home was, was safe to go home to. Um, with the loss of running water, uh, power, cooling mechanisms, et cetera, in people's homes, uh, Sometimes it just wasn't safe for the elderly to return home, so we were able to care for them in our wards for a bit more of an extended period of time. Also in our hospital, we provided the support services uh, that allow the rest of the areas to run. So we had a lab which could protest, which could process tests on site. Uh, we also collaborated with the lab and the blood bank at Rand Memorial Hospital because they were still functioning so that way we could provide a little bit more elevated uh, lab capacity than normally just the field hospital can do. We had x-ray so this is a very valuable resource um, being able to um, 
take x-rays of broken bones. As you can see here, this assists the surgeons in planning their surgery and the post-op care, um, as well as managing chest infections and other um, conditions that require x-ray. We also had portable ultrasound, uh, looking for blood clots and vessels, basic prenatal ultrasounds, um, and other uses for that as well. We had a pharmacy, uh, so we were able to provide all of the medications needed for the care of in patients, as well as in coordination with Rand Memorial, we're able to provide the outpatient pharmacy needs as well. So we combined both their medications and ours and our staff worked very closely together uh, to be able to continue to provide medications for the community in Freeport. And also very critical in not only looking after people's emergency medical needs is the collaboration of all of the psychosocial and um, support that people need to be able to live um, healthy lives both in the hospital and at home. So we were able to partner with social workers, physio, um, and other supportive community-based programs within Freeport to allow um, our patients to get what they needed uh, to thrive in kind of this very challenging time. Not only were they dealing with critical health issues, um, but a lot of them had lost family members or were unable to return home because of the devastation that had um, happened to their home. So from the very beginning, as I mentioned, the close collaboration with both the Ministry of Health and the Pan American Health Organization, but in the day-to-day, -day, we partnered uh, with Ram Memorial Hospital. For the first month of the journey there, uh, Samaritan's Purse fully ran the hospital, our staff. Uh, we provided the doctors, the nurses, the lab techs, um, all of the maintenance and um, operational support. Um, so this was mainly to allow the staff of Rand Memorial, who had not only gone through the trauma of the storm, um, being at work and see, seeing their hospital flood and having to care for their patients in that. But a lot of them had um, damage to their own homes, uh, maybe lost friends or family members. And this really allowed them to uh, take time off work, to rest, uh, and to be able to care for their own homes and their loved ones. But after that first month, uh, we very quickly started to integrate their staff in with ours um, to, for one, let them continue to work, um, but also to start training them on working within a field hospital. Well, clinically, uh, they're well-trained doctors, nurses, and surgeons. Um, some aspects to working in a field hospital versus a brick-and-mortar facility just need to be learned on the job and with mentorship from disaster specialists. So all of these staff were trained and mentored throughout the month of October and then in the month, the last half of October and the beginning of November, uh, we moved very quickly through transition with their clinical staff um, with less and less of the staff from Samaritan's Purse working in, in the hospital and more and more of the Rand Memorial staff. So they took over full wards, uh, they took over the running of the operating theater with their surgeons, et cetera. And then on November 3rd, um, they took over the full emergency department. Um, and at that point, they moved the emergency department back over to Rand Memorial Hospital and the field hospital became uh, strictly for surgical and for inpatients. By the middle of November, all of the clinical staff for Samaritan's Purse had gone home uh, and the field hospital itself was running as uh, Grand Bahama Health Services. Um, Samaritan's Purse continued to be very closely involved in working with Rand Memorial Hospital up until March of 2020. 
uh, in an operational support capacity. So, so their clinical staff could focus on caring for the patients and their operational and construction staff could focus on the renovations and the needed work that needed to be done in Rand Memorial so they could move back. Uh, Samaritan's Purse continued to provide uh, the water, the electrical, as well as the other operational support that was needed for the hospital. Currently, um, Samaritan's Purse is no longer actively involved with the hospital, um, but it's still being used to provide inpatient services on uh, Grand Bahama Island while the renovations to Rand Memorial are ongoing. In total, during our time in partnership with Rand Memorial Hospital, we treated uh, 6,560 individual patients, had over 1,200 admitted to the hospital, and performed over 276 surgical procedures. Um, so this was a very exciting um, work to get to be a part of. Well, the hospital was a major part of our response to Gramahama. It wasn't the only response. Um, so ongoing while the hospital was being set up and run, there was a multitude of other multi-sectoral programs that were working across Grand Bahama Island, Abaco, Elbow Key, and other smaller keys, Man of War, uh, Sweetings Key, and other areas. A critical need right in the early days and continues to be right now is the supply of fresh water. So we had uh, five D salination units that you can put one end into the ocean and out the other and uh, provide clean, free drinking water. So we had that in a few places, as well as we provided um, crucial water access points and in more inland areas. So we would truck water uh, and fill bladders at clinics, community centers, and schools where then um, it would either supply the building that it was at or provide um, water for the community. Pictured here, you can see a uh, bladder that's set up, I believe, in a schoolyard uh, where the community can come and they can fill their water tanks, I mean, sorry, their water uh, bottles and bring them back home to provide water for drinking, for cooking, um, and if needed, uh, for bathing. We also had a bit of a two-phased shelter program. So initially the provision of tarps. So if people still had a roof or had some portion of a roof, they could get tarp on uh, to prevent further water damage from other storms that might have come. And as ABLE, we provided tarps, but we also provided uh, roofing and tarping crews. Uh, so they would go around and they would help people actually install the tarp on their roofs uh, to be able to provide that shelter from the weather. As you saw in the video, we also had non-food item distributions. Uh, so these were ongoing in the first weeks and months after the storm where we um, helped provide generators, blankets, cook stoves, fuel, solar lights, and air mattresses. Uh, one thing, because the flood had come through and just essentially saturated everything within people's homes, mattresses uh, were a big need. Um, tables and things like that, maybe they were able to put in the sun and dry off, uh, but just the length of time that the water sat in the homes um, had ruined a lot of mattresses. So we were able to provide air mattresses with pumps uh, built into them to be able to provide people a place where they could sleep. So such a monumental event um, is not over. Uh, people are not recovered. Homes are not fixed within a matter of days or weeks um, or even months. So nine months after after Dorian, Samaritan's Purse is still present in the Bahamas. Uh, we've set up one of our country offices, like I spoke about at the beginning, uh, to be able to provide ongoing program programs. Um, 
So this is focusing on still a little bit of the um, initial disaster effort, but ongoing restoration and building resilience within the communities. So we have ongoing water projects um, in areas that still do not have potable water. Uh, we have home and church rebuilding. So this is focused on those who are really the most vulnerable, the elderly, the disabled, um, perhaps single parent homes, um, those who do not have insurance, um, and being able that, to assist them to have a kind of minimally acceptable standard of life. So helping with actual roofs instead of just tarping, um, mud outs and drywall um, placement um, and other um, work to ensure that their home is not only um, inhabitable, but it's safe, that the mold is removed and that there are measures put in place as we approach hurricane season once again uh, to hopefully prevent a repeat of the year previous. Another part of the uh, restoration that we're assisting with is debris removal. So this is more focused on Avico and the surrounding keys. Uh, Samaritan's Purse has been able to date clear away 49,000 cubic meters of debris. So this is through um, using heavy machinery on the islands, bringing it to central location points, loading it onto barges, um, and then barging it away to designated disposal areas. So as I'm sure you can appreciate, it's hard to rebuild when the devastation and the debris is all still around. So this very critical action um, just kind of clears the way for people to then have the ability to work on their own homes um, and also access uh, sites that up until even this day have been obscured by the debris. One of the other programs that the office runs um, is difficult to kind of picture and portray uh, through a video, um, but it seeks to equip leaders, so church leaders, school leaders, community leaders, for preparing for disasters and supporting others in crisis. Um, hurricane season is once again starting, and whereas we don't know where they will form or which islands or which communities will be the most impacted, the reality is, is sometime in probably not the too far future, a tropical storm or hurricane will once again come to the Bahamas. So how can we assist people in being prepared, whether that's learning how to make a personal disaster plan, um, um, knowing how to properly secure your house, your windows, prepare for food and fresh water. Um, so looking at disaster preparedness from a physical standpoint, but also from a psychological standpoint. Um, in the weeks following Dorian, um, every time it would rain, the children would become very scared. They were worried. They had memories of when Dorian came and they had to swim. Um, so um, providing leaders um, and families just kind of with also the psychological tools to be able to cope um, living in an area that's quite prone to disasters. So while not only hurricane season looms on the horizon, so does the, rea the reality of doing disasters in the midst of a pandemic, um, which in itself in some places can be a disaster. Um, and this has impact in numerous ways. It shifts resources um, to targeted responses. Um, pictured here is um, one of our field hospitals that Samaritan's Purse deployed specifically for COVID-19 response. Uh, this one was in Italy. Um, and in areas that are prone to natural disasters, um, having COVID-19 also present um, may shift resources from natural disasters to uh, this public health crisis. Uh, this is our field hospital that was in New York. Um, and both of these hospitals there also were there to assist systems, healthcare systems that had been stretched beyond the breaking point. So 
whereas Random Memorial had been decimated by a flood. Um, both these hospitals in Italy and New York that we came alongside to support had been decimated by a flood of patients. Uh, so just kind of a bit of a different way of looking at a disaster, um, but the ways that different organizations come alongside systems to support them is still very, very similar. Um, in the same vein of that there is programs that are specifically for COVID, um, there's also a need to adapt programs for COVID uh, where they already exist. Um, so here's just a really short video showing how, um, how the Bahamas has actually adapted one of their water projects to um, COVID. So we'll see if this comes through. Frank, are you able to share this video? Oh, yeah. We are standing here outside of the country office on the island of Grand Bahama in the country of the Bahamas. For COVID-19 prevention, we are primarily working in the wash, the water sanitation and hygiene sector because the hurricane actually inundated the water table of these islands and made most of the water from the tap undrinkable. Since Hurricane Dorian hit the Bahamas, Samaritan's Purse has been here distributing safe drinking water for people in need. We've been able to make some adjustments to our program to make sure that these sites remain safe in light of everything that's happening with the virus. Some of these prevention measures that we've been able to add include disinfecting tap stands regularly, includes hand washing stations, and it also includes adding 34 wash monitors to our team. So these are people who are at these sites all day, every day, helping people to collect water and helping educate people about the virus. And they're here to provide encouragement and to care for people as they're coming to collect water in these worrying times. So the other way that COVID is going to impact disaster response, um, whether that be hurricane or otherwise, is in new programs. So some of the things I'm about to mention here are not um, are not 100% um, things that might need to be followed in every single occasion. Um, but the thing to be really considering is that any kind of programming or the activities within your program need to be compliant with local public health jurisdiction and federal guidelines. So some of these may include in your new programs, um, making considerations for social distancing, whether that's in information sessions uh, for your workers, for volunteers, or for residents who are going to be impacted by the programming. Um, you may need to limit the size of work teams, um, as well as uh, something that's been talked about quite a bit is shelters, um, making sure that we are able to um, provide social distancing within emergency settings. Personal protective equipment, um, so whether that's requiring uh, staff or volunteers to be wearing personal protective equipment in addition to any kind of occupational PPE that might have previously just been required. Uh, making accommodation um, changes. Uh, I, I know for ourselves, um, as you saw on that map of the uh, field hospital, normally up to 36 staff sleep in each of those staff tents. Uh, so whether that looks 
like providing individual tents, um, less people to allow for spacing, or in cases of volunteers, maybe only um, allowing daytime volunteers from a nearby area. Um, and then lastly, equipment cleaning. Um, Whereas before, maybe cleaning off your tools and just putting them back in um, was part of the end of the day routine. Now also um, making sure that allowances is made for disinfecting equipment between users. Now all of these obstacles um, are able to be overcome by proper preparation uh, and training. Uh, as is the hallmark in any disaster response. So taking COVID and adding it to natural disasters is something that I feel us as a um, as an organization um, and disaster response um, as a line of work is very, very pre prepared to do. So this concludes uh, the presentation portion of our webinar and I just want to say thank you so much for your attention. It's a pleasure to be able to share with you today. Thank you Melanie. Um, this is Elizabeth Davis and I'm going to help facilitate the uh, the next section which is the question and answer portion. Um, so I've been monitoring the question section and I invite those attendees who have um, been here through your presentation to continue to use the question section uh, to put forward questions and I'll monitor those and um, pull those together for you Melanie. Um, I also note that clearly some of the attendees have my private cell phone number because they've been texting in questions to me instead of using the question bar but that's okay we'll we'll take them any which way we can get them I'll just have to split screen sort of. So one of our first questions, um, Melanie, as you catch your breath there, uh, is, a, is a comment, an observation, and then a question. So the first um, question, it comes from one of our colleagues in, in the New York City area, who says that the field hospital was a very, very impressive setup. Um, but asks then, what was your plan for shelter and operational continuity in the event of another tropical storm following Dorian? Something that is obviously a high probability and uh, an issue that we're sure you have a very informed answer for. So let me pass that back to you, Melanie, to take that question. Yeah, thank you so much for the question. Um, and yes, the field hospital itself is. Um, it's it's an impressive system. Um, the tents themselves can withstand um, between 60 to 70 miles per hour wind, um, but in the Bahamas, we did have a um, evacuation plan in the event that a tropical storm or, um, God forbid, a hurricane did occur. Uh, we did track one or two um, and move to stage one or two of our evacuation plan. Um, but basically it entails um, looking at alternate safe spaces for patients. Um, and in our case, the building that was located on the property had previously been an outpatient clinic. Uh, so we had plans in the case of a storm to move the patients into that building along with the essential uh, equipment and staff needed to care for them uh, for a 24 to 48 period. Um, sorry, a 24 to 48 hour period of time. Um, so in doing that, the kind of stages of the plan in, include the preparation as far as all of the work that goes into an evacuation plan, um, the equipment needed, the staff, the um, kind of moving of the operational support equipment, whether that be generators or um, emergency water and food and things like that, and having them pre-positioned inside the building. Um, and then kind of the plan as far as how do you consolidate the hospital into kind of one central area, so that way your final move is essentially from that central area across into that build, building. So our plan included things like um, the stage um, deflation of the tents, so the tents just get deflated inflated and then lashed down to the ground. So starting kind of at the exterior um, and moving everybody um, step by step into a core area and then that final move um, across um, 
the essentially the driveway in into this building so not ideal and thankfully we didn't have to enact that plan um, but yeah from the moment the field hospital gets set up um, in my brain we are making fire um, fire evacuation plans flood wind um, and in cases of uh, hurricane um, places to shelter and Melanie Elizabeth here again, um, paraphrasing uh, an add-on question here, um, which is, again, luckily you didn't have to go there, but in the event of a need to, to execute what you just outlined, what would be the, the time frame sort of from landfall, minus uh, from landfall? So if you were going to have to pull the trigger and start that kind of an operation uh, to consolidate, as you described, um, mm -hmm. What is that point in advance of landfall for you for something like this? Yeah, so that point in um, anticipation of landfall is about three days for us to say yes, we are going to um, to move forward on this plan. Um, and like I said, it's very staged. So if in the event that um, the storm moves or anything like that, uh, we are able to kind of just stop and continue operations as um, as uh, previously scheduled but we kind of count on about three days to um to be able to do it in the most safe manner so that way the moment the storm is over we can pop back up and can and start seeing patients again within a matter of hours so the final like move across the street would would be within five to ten hours of landfall that we would be doing those final actually yes we are going to move the patients um, but all of the other prep work um, about two to three days. Okay, so thank you for that, Melanie. Um, I'm uh, I'm reading a rather lengthy um, text question, so I'm going to try to consolidate this. Uh, and if if I'm not quite getting this reflected the right way, then um, feel free to hit me with a follow-up text. Um, so the question is that uh, recognizing that the services that were described are for a field hospital operation and pivoting more to the experience um, within the United States anyway, I, I'm adding that, I'm assuming that's what we're talking about for COVID-19. Um, uh, was there ever any consideration that the Central Park operation, um, which was being um, uh, completed in unison to support a hospital system, was there any, uh, uh, any conversation that that could be specialized? So if the hospitals, for example, um, were able to handle even the amazing uh, overflow that they, they were dealing with, could your units then be specialized to handle um, nursing home type tasks or tasks for uh, vulnerable, um, medically vulnerable populations that are um, outside of the hospital context but need to be maintained outside of a hospital context? I think that's the gist of that question. Yeah, um, no, if you can help us with that. Yeah, no, for sure. And I'm sorry, I might not have made that clear in the interest of time regarding the New York um, and the Italy responses. So those units, while they were based on the modules and the shell of our emergency field hospital, were specific to COVID. So we did not have an ER, we did not have an OR. What we did there was we expanded our ICU uh, to be able to have 10 ventilator patients. Our step down had 10 to 12 patients on non-invasive positive pressure ventilation and then our wards um, provided care for an additional 40 patients um, that required oxygen and all of our patients within that facility were COVID positive. Um, now specific to providing care to, to nursing home um, type clientele, there are some limitations with the field hospital setup as far as um, access and mobility. Um, so we don't discriminate against having nursing home patients and we definitely cared for patients within our facilities both in the Bahamas and Italy and New York who were completely bed bound or had other um, complex chronic health conditions um, but um, those patients are best served within kind of brick and mortar facilities that have things such as lifts and um, all of those kind of things that make 
caring for full care patients just that little bit um, better for them, um, but we are able to accommodate them. And I think there's a, hold on, there's a follow-up coming into that one. Um, the follow-up, I think, I'm just reading this real time. The follow-up seems to then ask, is there an, a situation where your organization would come in to support in a built facility? Um, so bring in all those services, the staff, the, the stuff staff equipment that you've referred to in one of your earlier slides, um, but yeah. not need to do it in this kind of a field setup, need to do it in an already established location. Yeah, definitely. So we do do tailored responses. Also in New York, we provided the staff and the infection prevention control measures uh, for for two wards within a uh, um, healthcare system that was overwhelmed. Uh, we're currently exploring similar options in um, the Navajo Nation as well as in Alaska, looking to see how can we best support a system without having to create a parallel or um, an additional physical facility. So yes, we do um, we do accommodate um, as best as we can to whatever the needs are. Um, our goal is never to come in and just set up because we can but to actually do a thorough assessment as to what the need is. In um, the Bahamas, it was a physical structure, um, but within a month, the staff were not needed. So that's where the structure remained and the Bahamas staffed it. Uh, whereas in other areas like New York, um, the hospital had the building and we provided the staff. Great, thank you. Um, again, trying to do the split screen. Are there any other questions? I just want to put that out. I know we still have attendees on here. I can see you all on the dashboard on this side. Um, and I don't want to miss any questions that you might have. Um, perhaps you all are slow typers such as I am. So I'm giving you a few moments here as I just talk to see if perhaps you want to type in another question. Um, by the way, Melanie, as we just give it a moment, um, we see in the question bar, uh, heartfelt thank yous, um, obviously being extended uh, to your organization for the efforts. And um, we hope that you will take those and pass them along. Um, those thank yous go a long way. We certainly know that. Um, okay, so I am I'm not seeing any questions coming in and I'm not seeing any bubbles on my text where I'm waiting for somebody at this point. Um, so I, oops, wait a minute, I spoke too soon, hold on a second. Uh, okay, how large of an organization hospital can you actually operate is the question that's now coming in. So what is, uh, sort of give us the spectrum from micro to macro of what would be um, your capability? Yeah, absolutely. So this goes into a little bit more of the tiers that I described with the WHO. So um, the, the what was in the Bahamas was a tier two. Uh, so the next step up from that is a tier three surgical hospital. So this is similar to what we deployed in Mosul, northern Iraq, uh, for the liberation of Mosul. So that is a um, emergency and trauma. Um, similar to the Bahamas, but it expands on the OR capacity. So it has two ORs, um, a four bed ICU, and then up to 50 ward beds. Um, so that is kind of the top, like largest facility, um, but the scope of the types of responses we do goes from everything from mobile med, um, so essentially backpacks, um, to um, hike into remote locations, uh, tier one, which is an outpatient department, um, and that can have specialized modules. So the Mozambique response for the outpatient department with a surgical and inpatient that was just focused on maternity, so C-sections, delivering babies. Um, and then there's the infectious disease modules, so cholera, Ebola, um, and like we saw in New York and Italy, um, our new respiratory care unit. Uh, which is a 68-bed facility, like I mentioned, with uh, the capacity for 10 ICU patients. Um, and then there's also uh, very small forward surgical units um, that can be deployed um, using very compact equipment uh, to be able to provide rapid surgical response, um, say following an earthquake or something like that. 
Okay. Um, thank you for those answers. And I'm just going to check one more time. This is kind of like where you pretend to be an auctioneer and you say going once, going twice. <laughs> and since um, we appreciate everybody's time, we certainly appreciate your time, Melanie. Uh, we know that participants here, attendees, as well as our presenters are pulled in many, many directions on our good days and certainly are stretched uh, now especially into many different directions. So um, on behalf of the National Hurricane Conference, I want to thank you and thank you from our committee as well for participating, for giving us of your time, for being able to pivot and be flexible um, when we changed to this virtual format. Um, and as we know, the, the format of a, a panel changed to a focused single presenter. Um, we thank you. You're a rock star. We really appreciate it. And uh, we know that this information just for the attendees will be made available for, for you to go back and take a look at on the Hurricane Conference website. Um, give us just a little bit of time on the technical side to get that posted. And please let your colleagues and your peers know about this amazing presentation also. Um, I guess if there's a rainbow um, or a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow on your image there, it's that we now have a library of resources um, from this year's uh, presentations. So with that, I'm going to say thank you again to you, Melanie, and thank you to all the attendees who have uh, so um, patiently been with us for the last 90 minutes. And I invite everybody to continue to monitor the Hurricane Conference's website as we add more and more presentations uh, over a two-week period. So thank you all. Please, everybody, be safe, be smart, be well. Thank you very much. Thank you.